Today, we're talking about lobbying, AI safety, and faux outrage that could absolutely undermine everything that anyone in AI safety is trying to achieve. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown, aka a live NLW aneurysm today. I woke up this morning to a scoop from Time Magazine. Billy Perigo, the investigative journalist behind said scoop, writes, flashing red light emoji, scoop. OpenAI lobbied the EU to weaken forthcoming AI regulation, even as in public it calls for stronger AI guardrails, documents obtained by Time show. So what we have here is the promise of a smoking gun of hypocrisy, a confirmation of the sort of regulatory capture that many have suspected on the part of Sam Altman and OpenAI. The idea or the concern is that the reason that OpenAI or companies like them are advocating for regulations or rules is that they really just want to pull the ladder up behind them and make it so that new competitors can't compete. Now, by extension, they also want the rules to be things that they can actually comply with. And so, of course, they have an incentive to, as Times puts it, water down those regulations. Now, in question is a white paper on the European Union's Artificial Intelligence Act from September of last year. And it's worth starting with a little bit of context. The EU started the process for the EU AI Act in 2021. This was pre-generative AI. It was designed to be a risk-based approach in which there were different remediations, recommendations, policies, mechanics, etc. for different AI based on what it was actually being used for. In other words, the EU theoretically recognized that there was a difference between generating an image and using AI to profile future potential criminals and arrest them in advance. Now, importantly, mid-2022 is when DALI, GPT-3, and Stable Diffusion all came out, showing the promise of generative AI. That hadn't really been considered in the first year of drafting this act, and so the European Parliament quickly worked to graft on a set of new provisions for generative AI. Now, of course, when you graft on new provisions that have been considered for less time, there is naturally going to be a bit more calibration required. This is inherent in any sort of policy process. There is precedent for how to deal with this in Europe with the MECA, or Markets and Crypto Assets Regulation Act. In MECA, which was started during the ICO boom, they made the determination to not include too much about NFTs and DeFi, even though those things have been around for a couple years now, in the rules that were passed just this year. The reality was that those issues were different than the context that had been negotiated, and so they needed to be saved for MECA too. Now, of course, in the AI Act, they weren't going to ignore generative AI completely. But they did need to race to catch up, and so as part of their consultation with the EU, OpenAI was asked to present some suggestions, and in September 22 did in the form of this white paper that Time has now published. Before we discuss the way that Time framed this, let's just look at what the actual paper says. The first section is all about what classifies as a high-risk system. Again, the EU was making different rules for how risky something was, and so OpenAI was of course concerned with whether its tools would be labeled high-risk or not. Basically, what they argue in this section is that the way that the rules were written at the time, their general purpose models such as GPT-3 might be considered high risk because they could theoretically be used for high risk purposes. In contrast, however, OpenAI writes, by itself, GPT-3 is not a high risk system, but possesses capabilities that can potentially be employed in high risk use cases. Accordingly, we have dedicated significant resources to determining guidelines, best practices, and limitations for uses of our services. We currently outline a set of high-stakes applications in fields such as law, medicine, politics, finance, and civil services, where applications proposed to be built using our services are subject to additional scrutiny that requires clear identification and management of risks. We consider and continue to review on an ongoing basis the different ways that our systems may be misused, and we employ many protective measures designed to avoid and counter such misuse. The current framing may inadvertently incentivize an avoidance of active consideration of ways that a general purpose AI system may be misused so that providers do not have, quote, sufficient reasons to consider misuse and can avoid additional requirements. The fundamental nature and value of general purpose AI systems are that they can be used for many application areas. We do not think it would meet the goals of safe and beneficial AI to inadvertently encourage providers to turn a blind eye to potential risks. We suggest reframing the language to incentivize rather than penalize providers that consider and address system misuse, especially if they take actions that indicate they are actively identifying and mitigating risks. The second section is about a provision that would designate a huge portion of content generation systems as high risk because they generate, quote, text content that would falsely appear to a person to be human generated and authentic or, quote, audio and video content that appreciably resembles existing natural persons. 
OpenAI again points out that they have a number of systems in place to allow them to verify synthetic origins of images, have rules around people purposely using their tools to mislead, and suggests and said that the AI Act can, quote, sufficiently require and ensure that providers put into place reasonably appropriate mitigations around disinformation and deepfakes, such as watermarking content or maintaining the capability to confirm if a given piece of content was generated by their system. TLDR, the way that at that time the provision was written in the AI Act, would make content generation AI a priori high risk versus trying to put in place systems that prevent high risk uses for the underlying technology. The third section is about what they call new conformity assessments for substantial modifications. Basically the idea that if OpenAI's model, which was previously approved, gets some big update, it needs to be approved again. On the face of it, the principle isn't disagreed with, but what they talk about is the fact that this gets very murky very quickly. In other words, what constitutes a substantial modification? Software in the modern world is deployed extremely iteratively. Small updates are pushed constantly rather than there being one big update per month or anything like that. Now, even with that, OpenAI's only suggestion was to create an exemption for updates and modifications that are made for safety or risk mitigation reasons. With, by the way, the ability to be rolled back should there be compliance concerns thereafter. The fourth and final section is really just about debating what uses are high risk or not, which is of course what the European Parliament was doing at the time, and in some ways this is just OpenAI participating in that conversation. The examples they give include job seeking, basically saying yes, it's high risk if AI is being used exclusively as the way that someone is selecting who should be hired, but there's also plenty of uses of AI which could help modernize and significantly speed up and improve the job seeking process, such as people using generative AI to write better job descriptions. They make a similar argument around vocational training. The piece concludes, Given the continued advancement of AI systems capabilities, we expect that currently unknown high-risk use cases will continue to emerge, making it important to ensure that the AIA remains agile in capturing ongoing developments. Quickly capturing new high-risk AI systems and removing those which have proven themselves sufficiently low-risk must be low-friction. So that is the actual piece that this whole scoop was based on. But let's now talk about how Time Magazine decided to frame their piece. First of all, the headline, exclusive, OpenAI lobbied the EU to water down AI regulation. It's hard to ignore the politics of choosing the phrase water down to describe this, but let's continue. The lead reads, the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, has spent the last month touring world capitals where, at talks to sold out crowds and in meetings with heads of governments, he has repeatedly spoken of the need for global AI regulation. But behind the scenes, OpenAI has lobbied for significant elements of the most comprehensive AI legislation in the world, the EU's AI Act, to be watered down in ways that would reduce the regulatory burden on the company. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a little bit different than what we just read. Now, stunningly to time, it appears that the EU might have actually thought some of the ideas and suggestions were good. Time writes, in several cases, OpenAI proposed amendments were later made to the final text of the EU law. Indeed, Time writes, OpenAI's lobbying efforts appear to have been a success. The final draft of the act approved by the EU lawmakers did not contain wording present in an earlier drafts suggesting that general purpose AI systems should be considered inherently high risk. Instead, the agreed law called for providers of so-called foundation models, or powerful AI systems trained on large quantities of data, to comply with a smaller handful of requirements, including preventing the generation of illegal content, disclosing whether a system was trained on copyrighted material, and carrying out risk assessments. Now, of course, the presumption lurking behind that text is that this was a fundamentally worse approach. This was the watering down of which the article speaks. And in case you had any doubts that that is what Time is trying to say, here are the quotes they chose to run as evidence. From Sarah Chander, a senior policy advisor at European Digital Rights, quote, They got what they asked for. The document shows that OpenAI, like many big tech companies, have used the argument of utility and public benefit of AI to mask their financial interest in watering down the regulation. Another quote, this one from Daniel Leffer, a senior policy analyst focused on AI at Access Now's Brussels office. Quote, what they're saying is basically, trust us to self-regulate. It's very confusing because they're talking to politicians saying, please regulate us. They're boasting about all the safety stuff they do, but as soon as you say, well, let's take you at your word and set that as a regulatory floor, they say no. Now to read Twitter, a set of people who I can only assume haven't actually read this piece are pushing this exact narrative and tonality from the piece. Fellow tech podcaster Paris Marx writes, Billy Perigo confirms what many of us suspected. Sam Altman went around the world talking about the need for AI regulation, but in private, OpenAI successfully lobbied to water down the EU's AI Act. It ensured its products would face less stringent rules. Sasha Costanza Chalk writes, OpenAI, our extremely powerful general artificial intelligence might kill us all. Please regulate us. Also OpenAI, but on the DL to EU regulators, 
what we're doing is not really high risk, and it's very important you let us run experiments in the wild. Cheris Papavangelou writes, ah, the typical big tech capitalist discourse of please regulate us, but not really. And then there's Scott Galloway, who frankly should know better writing. Shocker. OpenAI CEO Sam Altman giving speeches saying AI regulation is essential. Behind the scenes, OpenAI lobbies for significant elements of the EU's AI Act to be watered down. So there are two possible critiques of OpenAI here. The first is that they're lobbying at all. Well, guess what? They're a company. Companies lobby. In fact, everyone lobbies. Individual citizens lobby. Nonprofits lobby. Advocacy organizations lobby. Corporations lobby. The fundamental fact of reality is that corporations will lobby for what they think are better policies, including better policies for them. The whole point of democracy is that it's strong enough to take lots of different types of lobbying in and still come away with something that nudges us forward, even if it pisses off everyone along the way. The second possible critique, and this is really the big one exhibit in all of these tweets, is that OpenAI is being hypocritical, that somehow Sam Altman is speaking out of both sides of his mouth. You see it in all these tweets, that in front of the press, they're saying that AI regulation is important, and behind the scenes, they're really trying to water things down. This is why language matters. All of these tweets, shaping all of the opinions that they're shaping, are predicated on the idea that this represents an attempt to water down the legislation. It's right there in the title. However, as someone who does multiple videos and a podcast every day about this industry, I would venture to say that I've followed this a little bit more closely than most of these folks who are tweeting now. And what I saw was Sam Altman and OpenAI getting castigated by EU politicians for saying that they were worried about overregulation and that the way that the EU AI Act was structured at current, and by the way, this was in May, might not be workable for them and they might have to actually leave the EU. Now they walked that back and Sam Altman then went and had what were apparently productive conversations with numerous members of the European Parliament. But there was a whole press cycle being mad at Sam Altman for saying that OpenAI was worried that the EU might be overregulating. Kind of undermines the idea that he's saying one thing in public and another thing in private. Secondly, when it comes to OpenAI's position on things, people seem to be taking the idea that OpenAI is advocating for regulation and assuming that it means that to be legitimate and not hypocritical in that, they have to be lobbying for the type of regulation that these critics want to see, or that the far left in the EU parliament wants to see. The possibility that these critiques haven't considered is that OpenAI is, outside of just advocating for its own interest, lobbying for policies that they think would be better in general for regulating this space. These critiques don't consider the possibility that badly written regulation can do as much harm as it does good, or even more. They don't consider the unintended consequences of loosely written words drafted by people who are just trying to understand something very new, whose end result has enormous power to shape things in directions that warp something for the worse. And it's not like this is abstract. GDPR is well-intentioned legislation that does far less to protect privacy than it does to, one, annoy people because they constantly have to, one, opt into their privacy being broken, but it's still broken, and two, radically increase the market share of Facebook and Google when it comes to advertising because they're the only companies that are willing to pay for GDPR compliance costs. In other words, the squawkers on Twitter are so convinced that regulation is a priori good and so busy being angry at OpenAI for trying to push for the regulations that they think would be better, that they didn't take any time to share how they think the regulations could be better. It's all one big political game of confirming people's priors. So why does this matter? It's just one dumb piece, right? It matters in my mind because when the fourth estate constantly claims scoops and smoking guns that are actually nothing burgers, it undermines their credibility. In the world we're moving into, where we have the serious AI policy conversations that we're going to have, we need our institutions to have credibility. We need our political institutions to have credibility. We need our media establishment to have credibility. This was a hit piece, pure and simple. It had an agenda going into it. The words written in Time's piece don't match the words on the document that they shared. And so it's hard to see it as anything other than politically motivated. Maybe not just at OpenAI, but maybe as part of the larger culture war battle that the media has been fighting with big tech for going on five years now. Bad critique doesn't hold companies' feet to the fire. Bad critique undermines important critique later on. Bad critique doesn't lead to change, it leads to people tuning out. And so for people who are genuinely concerned about the risks of AGI, they should be frustrated that time is wasting its scoops and its exclusives and its heightened Twitter drama on a non-story for the sake of clicks. But whatever. So I have a podcast so I can go out and tell you what I think about the news instead of just having to listen to the garbage that is fed to us constantly, passed off as fact, and wrapped up in a bow to get us angry in predictable ways. That's it for today's AI Breakdown. If you're enjoying this, please like, subscribe, and share. 
Check out the podcast version in the newsletter. And until next time, don't believe everything you read.